Hey there, and welcome to New Life Church. We're glad you can join us. Before the message begins, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to all our social media platforms so that you can stay informed on all our latest content and events. If you feel led to invest in the ministry, please visit our website, newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again, and God bless. Before we take communion this morning, I want to share a few thoughts with you from the word of the Lord. The title of the message is A Fresh Recognition of Value. A Fresh Recognition of Value. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, this morning, God, it is accurate to say that we stand in awe of your presence. I'm so grateful, O oh God, that you help us and you help us to be mindful that, God, when we gather together like this, we don't just have the privilege of being with wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, but together we come into this house to stand in the presence of our sovereign God and our Holy Father. God, we thank you for that this morning. We don't take lightly the privilege of lifting our voices in song and adoration and worship to you, God. We don't take lightly fellowship with one another. We don't take lightly opportunities to encourage and to be encouraged by fellow believers. We don't take lightly, Lord, the opportunity to gather around your word. So, God, this morning, help us. Help us once again, O oh God, to not simply sermonize, but, God, to communicate truth from the heart and mind and word of Almighty God. Father, we stand in your authority over every intrusion of the enemy. And we silence it right now in the name of Jesus. That your voice will be the voice that is heard. Your name is the only one that will be glorified. And your purposes are the only ones that will be accomplished. Do that throughout this building right now, we pray. And God, we pray it in faith. We receive it in fact. And we seal it together, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. One of the rather relentless social and psychological and emotional and spiritual tragedies of our day and many others, it's perpetually poised to destroy believers, to, to affect, to undermine, to negatively impact any society and its citizens. One of those tragic things that fits in that category is the often crippling practice of self-devaluation. We look at ourselves and think, I'm just not worth it. I'm just not worthy. I would rather not be here. Everybody else would rather that I was not here. And you fill in the blanks, all manner of different things. I'm telling you, that thought is diabolical. That belches from the very corridors of hell. And it was designed in its perpetual Readiness to affect man, it was designed to undermine that which was created in the image of Almighty God. And what I mean by that relentless self-devaluation is this pressure to compare ourselves and to measure our own value by an absolutely unauthorized metric. How do we value ourselves? Do we need to do some self-evaluation and some introspection? Of course we need to do it. That's the only way we're going to get better. But if we're going to do that, we need to do that according to a metric that is authorized. So when I talk about an unauthorized metric, may I suggest to you today that that is any metric that does not come from the heart of Almighty God. God, our creator, is the one who defines for us value. He is the one who determines what makes us valuable in his presence and in the presence of one another. So we want to consider a few things this morning. And I would suggest to us today that we need a fresh recognition of value. And I want to take us into the word in a few moments. But let me give an example of how we often find ourselves looking to an inappropriate metric. Too often we compare ourselves to other people to their successes and to their material possessions, whether they are family or friends or siblings or co-workers or neighbors or celebrities 
or total strangers. The problem, one of the problems with comparing ourselves to other people is that most often we put ourselves at the bottom of the totem pole. I don't have as much as they do. I don't look as good as they do. I don't, I'm not as influential as they are, et cetera, et cetera, whether it's true or not. But many times we find ourselves putting ourselves uncomfortably at the bottom of that so-called measurement, the bottom of that totem pole, and it's not good. We compare ourselves many times to the ever-changing industry standards, and whatever the industry around us suggests to us makes us valuable and right. Am I tall enough? I was really doing some research in I was stunned, and I'd heard about it before, but, and I can't give you all the medical details. I didn't bother remembering all of that. But if a person wants to be taller, even in, in some of the hospitals in our area here, and there's a procedure, it takes some time where they can break your thigh bone or your shin bone, insert metal, and I don't know where the magnets come from, but between the metal and the magnets over a period of time can kind of stretch that so they can give you a couple of inches to your stature. No way. <laughs> no way in the world would I go through that. But it comes from the question or the self-assessment, well, I guess I'm just not tall enough. Am I thin enough? And that haunting question has made the diet industry annually more than a billion-dollar business, more than a billion-dollar profit-making machine. Because constantly, people are looking in the mirror, am I thin enough, am I, am I proportioned properly, and so on. And that is the industry standard against which we measure ourselves. Am I dark enough? So you have people who are spending all sorts of money in tanning booths and lotions to darken their skin, at least in the summer. Now that's an issue I've never been able to relate to. <laughs> but there are people who do that for whatever reason. I listened to a young lady saying the other day that she was deprived of melanin in her skin. I thought, oh, poor soul. <laughs> <laughs> On the other end of the same spectrum, there are those who are saying, well, am I light enough? So they spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on skin bleaching cream because someone has convinced them that lighter is better and brighter is righter. So somehow they spend all this money. I remember there was a guy in the church who I attended when I was growing up who for some reason, this is the first person I ever met who used bleaching cream, and he would do it, and his whole face and everything was this one particular complexion. Until one day, I saw this brother who was always in a suit, and he had an open-collar shirt. And there was this ring, and all of a sudden, it was somebody else underneath his Adam's apple. And I thought, oh my goodness, first time I'd ever seen this. But the industry tells us that lighter is better and brighter is right. So some people buy into that. Am I pretty enough? There's a very, very wealthy socialite whose first name is Jocelyn. I will leave it with that. If you ever saw any before and after pictures of Jocelyn, she was a very attractive young lady. She had long flowing hair and her features were, she could easily have been a model, but somewhere she was convinced that she was not attractive enough. So in her quest to become more attractive, she utilized some of their family's millions of dollars to go under the knife over and over and over again. Jocelyn also had an affinity for cats. So she thought that if I can look like a cat, then I'll be pretty enough. Surgery number one and number two and number three and number 14 were not enough. So as she went through all these surgeries, she changed her hairstyle and, and the flow of her hair to look more like a lion's mane. And she had all sorts of things after multiple surgeries, and she looks like a feline. And if you ever put her before and after pictures together, everybody perhaps, but Jocelyn would realize she looked much, much better before she caved in to the industry standard. Am I popular enough? Am I rich enough? And the list goes on and on and on and on. When the apostle Paul was exposing the pattern of the self-righteous religious leaders, he accused them of comparing themselves, not with others or with the industry standard. He said, you compare yourselves with yourselves. 
So that whatever your failures your, or your past failures, that kind of set the plumb line for what is right or your past successes. And what he said was, and I quote to him, he said, this is not wise. And one of the problems with using yourself as the plumb line or the metric by which everything must be measured is that one makes themselves the standard of perfection and righteousness and acceptability and of value. So what is the metric that we use to measure what is valuable? We'll talk about that in a few moments. In society, great value is all too often placed on one's wealth, on one's appearance, one's accomplishments, one's social status, one's influence, or one's popularity. And while all these things might have their place, and they might have their value when they are kept in their place, are these things really what God deems to be most valued? And I would suggest to you this morning that the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. Is one's social status the thing that makes someone valuable in the eyes of our creator? No, it is not. Is one's physical stature or physical appearance the thing that makes us Valuable in the eyes of Almighty God? Absolutely not. So we need to ask ourselves, then, where does God place the value? May I suggest that every now and then we need a fresh recognition of a few things that have always been and will always be valuable to God, and especially in the economy of his work and the economy of his kingdom. So what are some of the things? How do we know What's valuable with God? Thank you for asking. Please turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I want to be in the reading at verse 3. And then I want to highlight a passage that is rather, uh, rather familiar, I believe, to all of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to begin reading at verse 7. I want to start reading for, from verses 7 through 11. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, though fading it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Skip down to chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we, rather we have announced the secret in shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age who blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the, I'm sorry, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, our Lord, and ourselves as, as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We have this treasure in jars of clay. King James says, earthen vessels, to show that this is not from us, but it is from God. So let me remind you this morning of a few things that I believe are valuable from this text when it comes to the economy of God. Because in a brief nutshell, Paul captured some lessons that should be available to the church for all of time. He talked about the ministry of Moses when God gave Moses the word. 
The law was given to mankind so man could be aware of their sin. That's why he called it the ministry of death, because it simply made man realize you're a sinner, and if you don't repent, you're going to die in your sin. However, when that was given, Moses goes up on the mountain. You're aware of it. Moses is so impacted by the presence of God he literally was glowing when he came down from the mountain, so much so he had to put a veil over his face because people couldn't stand to see it. They couldn't take looking at it. Paul said, if that was glorious, which really was no glory, how much more than when the ministry of grace comes? How much more glorious is that? And this is the ministry God has given to us. And he goes on to talk about that which glorifies God. And he says, this great treasure, this great ministry of glory and of life that God has given to us, we have it tucked away in jars of clay in earthen vessels. And he puts it in us that he might show to mankind that this is not from you and from me. This is from God. But he chooses to work it through us. So in light of what Paul said, I want us to recognize a few things that he, and more importantly, that God deems to be valuable. Look, first of all, at the value of the treasure. Paul said we have this treasure in jars of clay, or we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The word treasure has several meanings. It means deposit or wealth. He said that the believers in the city of Corinth, he says that the believers for all of time, this gift, this ministry God has given to us, we have this, it's, it's a treasure. It is a deposit that God has placed within us. It is a wealth that God has given to us. And it's tucked away in these finite, limited, earthen vessels. Let me tell you what he said also in the same book, chapter 8, verse 9. Paul said this, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become Rich. Let me read that again. I want you to get it. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. If Paul meant that, then let me remind you this morning that you're rich. Now, most of us would like to translate that somewhere into our bank accounts also, but that's not what Paul was getting at necessarily. But he said it. He said, he who was rich took on poverty. He became flesh like us, so that in his taking on poverty, he might pass on to us the riches of his own. So we need to understand what that means, because positionally, Positionally, the Bible says you and I are rich. We have a deposit. We have a wealth that has been placed within us. And God places tremendous value on that treasure. So what does it mean to be rich? The word that is used here in Scripture in several places means to be prosperous, abounding, lacking in nothing. That identical word is used both literally and physically. So it's used of, of great monetary or great material possession. It's used of those things that are, are more ethereal, those things that are more intrinsic, those things that you cannot quantify and get a handful of it. This is why the Bible says of Joseph of Arimathea, it uses the same Greek word and says he was rich. We knew that materially Joseph of Arimathea was rich. He was a wealthy man. We know that from Scripture, but the same word is used by Paul speaking of God. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul said, God is rich in mercy. Glory to God. God is rich in mercy. James put it this way in James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But I love what John wrote in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. He said to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty 
yet you are rich. In verse 10, he said, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give unto you the crown of life. And there are many other passages. The Bible tells us that for those who are born again, for those who are part of the family of Almighty God, by his definition, there are treasures that he has deposited within our lives, and God himself says, I know what you might be going through, I know what the circumstances might be, but I, who am the first and the last, am here to tell you that you are rich. Glory to Almighty God. We need to understand that. We need to recognize that especially when the enemy comes and tries to beat us on every side of our head and tells us how unvaluable we are. God does not agree with that at all, nor should we. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. I remember telling God some years ago at a point of just stress and real frustration, I said to God, I'm willing to give it all up. I'm just done. Don't do that. <laughs> And I remember God's response. God is a patient father. He'll listen a time or two or maybe even three. But then when he spoke, he said these words. I wrote them down. You have no idea what you're saying. I'll never forget it. And he began to roll, for those who remember ticker tape, like an old, old tape. He began to roll the number of things that I didn't even realize I was talking about. The touch of God, the anointing of God, the blessings of God, the old manner of things. Son, I heard what you said, but I'm telling you, you have no idea what you're talking about. Don't be so quick to give up on the treasure. In those moments when it's difficult to walk as a child of God, in those moments when sin is much easier than walking in the manner of righteousness, don't be too quick to give up the treasure. Because when we say to God, I'm tired of all this, I'll give it all up. Folks, we do not understand fully what we are saying. Glory to God. God has deposited within us that which he considered to be wealthy. And that which Paul called treasure. Let me itemize for you a few of those things that are wealth within us. Let me give you just a couple of them. The mercy of God is part of that treasure. Paul said that it is through God's mercy that we have this ministry. The writer of Lamentations said this. He said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Part of this treasure is the mercy of God. Part of this treasure is the call of God. You and I are called to be servants, and I want to share this carefully because, yes, this applies to those who have a call to ministry, but I want to tell you that when we look at what Paul said, it applies to every one of us who is a born-again believer, who is called of Almighty God. The call of God upon our lives, we are all called to be, first of all, servants. Those who know the glory and the humility and the nobility of the towel and the basin. That God has called us to serve. Jesus said, the scripture says of Jesus, that the Son of Man came not to serve, or came not to be served, but to serve. King James, he came not to be ministered unto, but he came to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This is God incarnate. And when he identified himself, he said, I have come. Yes, when they asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He said, it is as you said, but understand before you proclaim that I was king of the Jews, Remember, I took up the towel in the basin, and he called himself a servant. And if I, your Lord and your teacher, should wash your feet, you should wash the feet of one another. Part of this great treasure God has placed within us is the ability to respond to the call of God to serve. Old song says, I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. Folks, we are called to be ambassadors those who are on assignment to represent Christ with the full endorsement and the authority of heaven. That doesn't mean you just go, I'm a child of God, I'll say what I want because I'm an ambassador, bless God. When we speak on the behalf of the Lord, when we speak what he puts in our hearts to share, never allow the enemy to dupe you into thinking that everything comes out of your mouth is necessarily sanctified 
or on a mission from God. So when we dare to say, I want to speak, I want to share something from God, make sure to the best of your ability that you have heard something from the Lord. But understand, an ambassador is a delegate sent with the full authority of the one who has sent them. When you drive off this property today and go to Wise or a Giant or to your favorite restaurant or you go home or you pick up the phone to call your cousin, you're an ambassador. You're a representative of Jesus Christ. We need to remember that because that's part of the treasure. So when you're the third person in the line, as frustrated as the second person in front of you and the 14 behind you because one person gets in line, I don't know how many, many people still use coupons, but this guy brought out 20 of them. <laughs> one at a time. One at a time. They happened to pick up three items that had no price on them. Ding, ding, ding. Can you call somebody to go get this for me? And you're thinking, I have some place to be. Where? Nowhere, but this is not where I want to be right now. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you're thinking, you know, let me just give a word to this person. I've got something to tell them. And I'm an ambassador of Christ. <laughs> so sometimes the best thing is just get out of the line. Just go to another line or just get in your car and go home. But we're an ambassador of Christ, the call of God. We're called as representatives of him. We're called to be oracles of God or mouthpieces of God or those who speak the declarations of God. Those who are, number one, commissioned to speak on behalf of God. And again, I offer the caution. If you say I'm sharing something with you from the heart of God, you better make sure you really believe that's the case. Secondly, in terms of this oracle, commissioned to speak on God's behalf, commissioned to tell people what God has said. This is what the word of the Lord says. Your opinion and mine is not going to get anybody to heaven. This is what the word of God has to say. And third is to declare the unsearchable riches of the kingdom of of God. Simon Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle, the mouthpiece of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God gives, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. This treasure is the call of God to be servants and ambassadors and oracles and to be stewards. Those who are entrusted with the management of God's prized possessions, whatever they happen to be, the call of God. What is this treasure? It's the anointing of Almighty God. Jesus quoted from Isaiah. We find the words originally in Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Bible says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me. What does that word mean? Literally, the word anoint means to rub or to be smeared with oil as in the rubbing of oil on a shield. Some of the shields, there were all sorts of shields they used to make in war, but one of the ones they would often use was made out of wood, and it was covered with leather. And they would soak the leather in oil. One would think oil was flammable, but au contraire. So when fiery arrows were short, and it would hit this, this oil-soaked leather, it would extinguish the fire. It sounds familiar, the fiery darts of the enemy. So they would anoint... This leather is like covering a house with paint. This action of anointing. This action signifies that a person was set aside unto God. Set aside unto God. Let me spend just a half moment on this one. You have been set aside unto the work of God. We think of anointing and we think of those who are called to do what some of us have the privilege of doing pastoring or preaching or teaching or evangelizing or doing those, and, and that's true. But not all of us are called to do that, nor should we be. Some are called to be anointed plumbers, anointed people working behind the desk at the bank, anointed dentists. I want my dentist to be anointed when I go to see them. Anointed carpenters and school bus drivers and teachers. God places us where he would have us to serve. Not everyone needs to have the responsibility to stand behind one of these. But every one of us has the call of God to make him known where we happen to be. And stop allowing the enemy to tell you that what is the mantle upon your life is inferior because you're not standing at this desk. 
Folks, feel the rub. Glory to God. God's hand has rubbed upon your life to serve where he has placed you and to do what he has called you to do. That's the anointing of Almighty God. There are people you will reach that I may never get a chance to talk to, who will never darken the doorstep of any church. But God has rubbed you in such a way with his oil that he's anointed you to go and do what he's asked you to do, what he has assigned you to do. Folks, that's part of the treasure that is tucked away in these earthen vessels. Please understand that. That is the plan, that is the will, that is the mind of Almighty God. David talked about it. The psalmist talked about it. He talked about the oil that ran down from Aaron's beard and just anointed him. The anointing of Almighty God, the rub of God, the placement of God upon our lives to do what he asks us to do and to fulfill it joyfully and not wonder, God, I want to do what this one's doing or that one's doing. That's not your call. God, place your rub on my life and help me to do what you've assigned me and ask me to do. What is this treasure? What is this treasure? This treasure is the revelation of God. It is the revelation of God. Paul said this back in the text. He said, God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Folks, God is still speaking to men, and God is still making very plain his eternal truth. What is this treasure? It's the revelation of God. God has revealed the glory of his son, Christ Jesus, and he's revealed that in earthen Vessels, praise God. Recognize the value of the treasure much more quickly. Let me tell you two other things. Recognize the value of the vessel. He said we have this treasure in jars of clay or in earthen vessels. That's us. So if somebody calls you jughead, thank them for it. You know, because <laughs> we're just jars of clay. We're just earthen vessels and and that's it. God always, he always, hear this, folks, he always places value on the individuals he has chosen. Always. Not just on the work he's called them to do, but on the individual he's called to do the work, whatever that work might happen to be. You and I are uniquely valuable and significant in the placement of our calling because God has designed it to be that way. I think that's clear, folks. Let me pick on somebody. I need a volunteer. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> Dean has skills that I admire. Somebody sang a heretical song some years ago, and they said, God is watching us from a distance. Not my God. But if I can borrow from the words of that heretical song, I am watching Dean from a distance because I don't want to get in his way. So when Dean is fiddling with electricity, when Dean is swinging the hammer, when Dean was up on the ladder doing this, I'm out of his way <laughs> because that's not what God has called or placed for me to do. I understand that there's a value to what Dean does that I don't have. And I watch and I admire and I see the hand of God upon him and upon each of you in the respective areas that you have. But you know what? As much as I, I love watching Dean at work, I'm meeting with Andy later on. Andy does all sorts of stuff on this property with these huge gigantic machines and teams of guys. And I stand back and I watch them and admire what they do. There are doctors and nurses in this room. You don't want me doing what they do. I admire what they do. But can I tell you this? Whether it's Dean or Andy or the doctors or the plumbers or those who cut hair or the electricians or the Uber drivers or whomever else, the thing I value most is not what you do, but it's you. The thing I love most about Dean, if Dean never turns another screw, I don't care. I value him as a brother. I value Andy as a brother. Where do I get that from? I get it from my heavenly father. 
Although he values the work he's called us to do, God always places greatest value on the vessel that he's called to do the work. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay. I don't know about you folks, but if I was God, I wouldn't have called half of us to do what he asked us to do. Because we're just folks. We're fickle. We're capricious. We're moody. We do things right sometimes. We don't do it right the other times. I feel like doing it now. I don't feel like doing it. We're kind of all over the board. Aren't you grateful that God is God and we're not? But in the midst of all of our caprice, he still looks at us and says, I've chosen you. You're my vessel. And folks, we're in good company. Name one of our predecessors who was not as capricious as us, whether it's David or Ruth or anybody else. They were just folks like us. But God saw them. This is a jar of clay. This is an earthen vessel. You are an earthen vessel, handpicked by Almighty God to do whatever it is that he has asked you in particular to do. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30, says this. God said, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. When we understand the value God places upon us, we say prayerfully before God, may you never be able to say that again. Because God, I realize that with all of my strengths and my hiccups, I'm the vessel you have chosen. So God, use me however you want to use me. God is looking for a man. The term is generic, a man or a woman. A man of action, because sometimes talk is cheap. And we need action to get the job done. Looking for a man of intercession, one who's willing to share the, and bear the burdens of others and bear the burdens of the Lord. When you and I intercede, we're not just bearing one another's burdens. We're carrying, we're holding on to, we're bringing before the throne of God those things that are upon the heart of our Heavenly Father. God is looking for a man or woman of favor, one who is walking right in the presence of God. Not in perfection, but God, I'm doing my best to walk right in the way that pleases and honors you. God, I want to be a vessel of honor, fit and ready for your use. Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, in a large house there are articles or vessels, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and of clay. Some are for noble purposes and some ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be an instrument of noble purposes, a vessel of honor, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. The question this morning, the rhetorical question for us, for every one of us individually, is what kind of vessel will you be? The choice is yours. Nobody else can choose the kind of vessel you're going to be. No one else can make you the kind of vessel that they think you should be or they think that God thinks you should be. It's up to every one of us individually. God, what kind of vessel am I going to be? Help me to choose to be a vessel of honor, fit and ready for your use. Paul said if a man cleanse himself, there's something we have to do. It's not one of those things that it's going to fall accidentally into whatever this position is. There's some work we have to do. Because we're saying by our actions in the presence of God, I want to be a vessel of honor, fit and ready for your use. Lastly, and very, very quickly, I will say this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. We need a fresh recognition of the value of the treasure. We need a fresh recognition of the value of the vessel. We need a fresh recognition of the value of those in need. The value of those in need, in the economy of the kingdom of God, the great value of the treasure is not just the treasure itself. And it's not just the ability of one to say, I possess the treasure. The great value of this combination is the dispensing of what the treasure is to those who are in need. Let me illustrate it as such. I go back, 2 Kings chapter 4. Let me recount for you a scenario. 
there was a widow. Her husband had been among the leaders of the people. He was now dead. She came to the prophet Elisha and said, the creditors are after me. My husband is dead and the creditors are after me. He asked her, what do you have? She said, I have nothing. I have nothing. I have a little bit of oil and my sons. That's all that we have. Elisha said to her, I want you to go to your neighbors and begin to gather jars. Get as many as you can. Line these jars up. Bring them into the house. Line them up. Nothing in the text suggests to us that he told her ahead of time why he was having her do it. But she went ahead and did it. So she and her sons went out and gathered as many jugs as they could. Then he said, I want you to pour the oil into it. Now, she said, I have a little oil. I don't know what size the vessel was. But he said, start to pour it into the jars. So she starts to pour. And she realizes that she's pouring this little bit of oil. It just keeps pouring. And it keeps pouring. And it keeps pouring. That one's filled up. She goes to the next one. And it keeps pouring. Scripture doesn't tell us how many jars there. In my mind, I'm thinking there must have been 30, 40 jars in there. And she keeps going from one to the other. Little bitty things she can hold in her hand. And she's filling all of them up. And when she got to one jar, she said, son, bring me the next. He said, there are no more. And at that point, the flow of the oil shut off. She had another conversation with Elisha. And he said, now I want you to take that oil. Go and sell it. Pay your bills. And there'll be enough left for you and your son to live off of for the rest of your lives. What is the point? The oil was the treasure. The jar was the vessel. But they were of no value until they were employed to meet the need of the widow and her family. Great vessel. Great treasure. Worthless to the widow. Until all of a sudden it was poured out in the place where it was needed. The vessels only realized their value as they provided and dispensed their content. God has given us great treasure. God has personally made us vessels. The question of the moment is, you, will you and I be available to God to pour out that treasure where it's needed? Great for us to leave church in a little while. Say, praise God. What a treasure. What wonderful things God has placed within us. That's exciting. And God, you've called me. You've chosen me to do whatever it is that you've asked me to do. Your hand, you rubbed me with your oil, and you've anointed me to do whatever your kingdom assignment for me happens to be. That's great. But it is utterly worthless to those out there or to those next to you until you pour out that treasure on those who are in need. The oil was worthless until it was poured out for the widow. It was worthless until she spent it where it needed to go. And her life was changed forever. You and I have this treasure in our hearts. But not just to contain it for ourselves. We have this treasure that we might pour it out to others who are in need. Does that make sense, folks? That's what God has called us to do. Let me add one more thing about this issue of value. It's one thing to say so-and-so is valuable. It's another thing to demonstrate it. This morning we take communion because God is not a God who's just given to talk. The Bible tells us that when we were not thinking about God, God sent his son that he might cleanse us from our sins. He might eradicate the sins of anyone who calls upon his wonderful and worthy name. Folks, that's what communion is all about. It's about the love of God. It's about the treasure that God has given, the gift, the treasure of salvation that he chooses to give to anyone whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You and I in this room today, you and I who are watching together, if we've been born again, we've received that treasure. If you've not been born again, it's time for you to lock into the treasure. 
by simply asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to become your Lord and Savior at this very moment. That's when the treasure makes sense. That's when communion makes sense. Communion is all about how much God loves you. So much so that he sent his son to do what you and I would not have to do. We don't have to go to the cross because somebody went for us. We don't have to have nails pounded into our flesh because someone did it for us. And all we need to do is call upon his name. This morning, if you have not received one of the communion cups, would you just slip your hand up very quickly? We want to make sure everybody has one. I don't know a better way to help us understand the value of God than to pause and come before the table of the Lord. When you walk out of this room today, regardless of what anybody says to you, the person who professes to love you most or the person who notifies you that they think you're utterly worthless, put both aside. And remember that there is the God who is, who says, I am precious to him. Glory to God. Glory to God.